Holy God, we ask the Lord to bless this time, and we ask the Lord to uh, to give me wisdom and a little bit of humor, and we ask the Lord to open the minds and the hearts uh, of the people here so that they might ask inquisitive and interesting questions. And we ask the Lord all this in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so I'm going to start off, I'm going to talk probably for for 10-15 minutes, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open the floor to all of you, because I think a lot of you have questions that um, um, are going to be very interesting questions, but I probably won't get to, if, if I just talk for 45 minutes, I'd probably wind up missing a lot of the questions, so I'm going to, I'm going to talk for 10 or 15 minutes, and then we're going to we're going to get into the meat of the questions, which I think will will be more interesting, quite frankly, and we'll go where it winds up going. Um, so, um, we're, um, the first question you might ask is, why did you go to Africa in the first place? And um, uh, I went to a seminary at Suwannee with a fellow, uh, and his name is Emmanuel Wata. And Emmanuel is the dean of the seminary there in Kisulu. And so he's been asking me for about three years now, two, three years, to say, hey, you know, when we were, when we were in seminary together, you said you would come and visit me. Well, guess what? Um, it's, uh, it's time now that you come and you visit. He says, I've been to America for three years. So you need to come to Africa for a couple of weeks. And, and so I was hemming and hawing, and I tried to put him off. So I said to my friend Emmanuel, I said, okay, well this summer I am going to come to see you in Kisulu. Uh, and that was about February. I basically said, okay, that's what I'm going to do for, for this summer. And he said, okay, well, I'm going to have you teach English. Uh, preaching English to, to some of my students here and um, and it turned out it turned out that I taught English as English because the students that he wanted me to teach to didn't have enough English to really do any preaching so I, I, I wound up um, preaching um, I mean, teaching English, and I teach English for about two hours a day, Monday through Friday, and and then we'd go uh, other days. We'd go visit parishes, or we'd go visit an orphanage, or we'd go visit uh, a hospital, or whatever, and we'd be going all over the diocese. Now, the diocese on a map doesn't look that big, um, but you have to remember that in the whole diocese there's probably about 20 miles of paved road uh, and all that's in the city of Kagoma and the city of Kasulu so basically uh, I, I, you know my estimate is that is that Greenville the city of Greenville has more paved roads than the whole of the country of Tanzania oh all right so so when you think about Tanzania, you do not think about paved roads. Um, think, th oh, there he said he was going to change, and my lord, he did. If I'm going to Africa, I'm, I'm going. Go look, he's got me. And let me tell you, it's hot enough in China. So let me tell you, the the um, the the national animal of Tanzania is is a giraffe. So, oh, not so a lion, not I, a, I, know, a I, know, I stuck my neck out. Yeah, that's, that. it, that's, that's right. <laughs> so, so I said, okay, I will come and I'll and I'll teach, I'll teach English, preaching in English. But I was, I was kind of like, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay, I think you know when you go to Africa, you kind of have to have a mentality of we'll see what happens. Um, because if you go there thinking that I want it to be just like it is here, I'm going to miss out on a lot of what's really, um, uh, what's really valuable. So if, if you go over there and you say, well, um, I'm going to every day teach English from, from 10 to 12, and then I'm going to do this to this, and then I'm going to do this to this, and then I'm going to do this to this, you're going to be so frustrated because, well, first of all, nothing starts on time. 
Um, it just, time is a suggestion uh, more than it is a directive. So, so you, have to, you have to just kind of be a little bit more flexible. And um, so when I, when I went over there, um, uh, I, you know, I, I had, had to fly, first of all, I had to fly from Charlotte to JFK, JFK to Istanbul, Istanbul to, to Dar es Salaam, Dar es Salaam to Kodomo. Which is about, which is over 20 hours of flights. Uh, so it, it, you know, your head is kind of spinning when you get off the plane in Kagoma, and Kagoma, you get off the plane and there's a hut, and there's a runway, and they drop you off at the end of the runway, and they point you over to the hut, and they say, "Go over there," uh, and so you you got your bags, and you go over there, and and that's that. And, and you know, you, you say, okay, well, that's fine, that's, that's good. Um, you know, I don't know why you would expect that there would be uh, O'Hare International Airport in Kagoma. You know, so somebody had said to me, they said, well, what was, what was the airport at Dar es Salaam like? And I said, imagine the airport at Asheville, only smaller. <laughs> I said, now, Dar es Salaam has seven million people. And it has an airport smaller than than Asheville. Uh, so so I, 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 I joked after I, I came back, I said, you know, if you go to Tanzania in search of uh, infrastructure, you uh, you you will uh, you will not succeed um, because it, it's not really there. If you go to Tanzania in search of of people, you'll have a great time. And so you have to keep that in mind, that you're going to visit people. Um, and culture. Uh, what? And culture. And culture, yes, that's, uh, yes, absolutely. And that that's really what is uh, of, of the essence there. So, so I got to Kasulu, and as, uh, as uh, Anita pointed out earlier, I, I, uh, I, I got there, and then um, the bishop greeted me and said, Oh, Robert, oh, it's so good to see you. We will be having a feast in your honor in about an hour and a half. So get cleaned up. So, uh, uh, so, so, um, so the first thing to know is that getting cleaned up in, in uh, Kasulu is, is a relative term because there's no water. Um, so in the dry season, and they're three months into the dry season, I couldn't go take a shower. Um, I, well, I did go take a shower. I, I went to take a shower, but then I turned the faucet on and there was a drip, drip, <laughs> drip, drip, drip of brown water. Okay. So I said to this lady up here, her name is Macrina, and her name is Agnes, but her name is Mama Ella, and her name is, uh, is oh, what's her, her el eldest daughter, Erica. Her name is Mama Erica, and the reason is that married women in Tanzania who have children go by the name Mama and then their oldest child. So, you, so, because, and I, 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 because I was going around, I said, oh, well, you know, I, I, I uh, Macrina's taking care of me. People would look at me and go, who? <laughs> who? And I said, uh, Mama Ella. Oh, yes, we know Mama Ella very well. <laughs> so, the other thing, too, is that, um, <coughs> is that this area of Africa, like a lot of Africa, is, is growing. Uh, but, but more than that, um, the people who are living in rural areas are moving to cities. Um, because there's, there's really no jobs in the, in the rural areas. There's farming. Is there but electricity? There is electricity, but even more than electricity, there are cell phones. Uh, so, um, so, so, I will get into that in just a little bit. Uh, so the city of Kasulu, um, 20 years ago, had 15,000 people in it. It now has 240,000 people in it. And I'm guessing in 10 years it'll have a million people in it. Um, and the reason I say that is in Kasulu, um, I would say that somewhere between 80 and 85% of the people are, are 21 or younger. So you're looking at a population that has very few elderly people, and um, 
And it's not because elderly people like you, Dad. That's right. I'm looking at you. Um, and it's not because el people die early. The, the younger death age has more to do with infant mortality than it does anything. But it's because actually um, children are living longer. Um, the diseases that they died of uh, at birth and before five, um, those are being treated. And so you have this boom of population. Um, because you have to remember, people would have 10, 12, 15 children with the expectation that two or three of them would live to be adults. And, 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 but now they're having 10, 15 children, and 9, 10, 11, 12 of them are becoming adults. So the population has shifted, and the bishop said, Robert, you know, family planning is an idea here. It's not practiced. Uh, but what you're seeing is, actually, there's a shift. People who have been to college and who are educated are having two or three or four children. So, so you're actually seeing that shift happen right now. People who live on farms, they're having huge, huge uh, um, families. And people who have white-collar jobs are having two or three children. And so you're seeing that shift happen right now. As many of you might know, uh, after the Br British uh, left Tanzania, in 1960, um, uh, Tanzania um, shortly thereafter uh, uh, um, became, uh, I wouldn't call it communist, but I'd say sponsored by the communist and very socialist. And so um, they, had, um, they had a lot of collectivization, uh, which wasn't a big deal because people didn't have a whole lot to begin with, but the economy never grew and the people really didn't have anything for about 30 years after, um, after they, they uh, gained their independence. And so um, right now, over the last about 25 years, they've really, you know, you would go over there and you'd say, wow, this is poor. And, and Emmanuel said to me, if you think this is poor, you should have seen it uh, when I was growing up. When I, he said, when I was four or five or six, he says, I remember nobody had shoes, and you had the clothes on your back, and that was it. And now people all have shoes, and they have a closet full of clothes. Dick, you would be proud of them. Uh, and uh, and uh, so, so my, point, my, point being, my point being is this is that, you know, if you go over there, you, you'll think, wow, this is very different from what, what I see. But in reality, it, it has come a long way in a very short period of time. But they're still trying to figure out um, capitalism in, 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 a, in a way that might be meaningful to somebody in the West. And you might say, well, well what do you mean? Well, like in a lot of other places that I've been in Southern Europe and, and in the Middle East, um, uh, the point of having your own business is almost to have your own business, not really to make a lot of money. Yes, people like making money, but it's more important that you have your own business. That means that you could have 45 coffee shops next to one another and fabric shops all over the place, and yet you can't buy a bottle of aspirin. Uh, because just um, people are not thinking about what's the best way to make money. They're thinking about, boy, oh, I'd like to run that type of shop or that whatever. So, so there, there's, there's lots of shops in, in Kasulu. There's very few shops that you could say, wow, that, I could get something there. Um, if you need a spare motorcycle part, they got plenty of shops for you. <laughs> if you, um, if you uh, need fabric, they got plenty of shops for you. But if, let's say, you needed um, uh, a television, you'd have to go to Dar es Salaam. So it's just the way it is. Things that you would think uh, readily available they wouldn't be there. There's so, no Walmart. There is no Walmart. <laughs> and, and, and I will say to the, to the better, and, and the reason is, so this piece of fabric here, this probably, and this you could make a shirt out of this, like this, this piece of fabric would probably be about five bucks. And then you could turn around, so, so you could 
buy this at a shop over here. You could turn around and you could have somebody measure you and, and sew it. In an hour, you could come back and your, sh and your shirt is there and you had a, you had a, 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 a made-to-measure shirt with the fabric that you wanted for under $10. Oh, nice. So that's where I got mine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, did, I missed you there. Um, so, so my point to you is that while there's no, while there's no Walmart there, it's pretty cool because you can get made-to-measure clothes mm -hmm. there and, and really cheaply. Um, but you wouldn't be able to find like Seer Sucker or, or, or a nice wool. And the reason is, uh, and I found this out, I had, a, I, had a, I had a black sports coat while I was there and it was linen and, um, and cotton. And um, I love that blend of linen and cotton but just about every dust particle in Kasulu was on me when I left. I came with a black jacket and I left with an ochre jacket. So, so my point to you is their fabrics that they wear are really made for, for not only that climate, but, but for the dust. Um, I was saying this to somebody downstairs. Um, they don't have four seasons where I went. They have two seasons. They have the dry season, which is cool, cooler, and dry, and then they have the they have the rainy season, which is is humid, rainy, and, and hotter. Uh, and and I was there in the middle of the dry season, so it was 75 degrees and sunny and no humidity. In the in the in the daytime, it was 55 degrees and, and no shower. And, no shower. That's exactly right. So so what I did was I said to them is I need I need a, a liter of water. Um, bottle of, of a liter of water every day um, and I took a shower in that bottle of water um, which is not a lot of water but it was what was there and, and it was uh, it was room temperature so I, I went three weeks without a hot shower I know you should all cry me a river uh, because I did that um, so so then the, the next question is well, what were the people like and the answer was um, you know, it's kind of, you know, as I wrote in one of my articles, uh, hospitality is is something that is just part of the culture. It's a bit like the South compared to the North. You know, in the South, people are going to invite you to your house and they want you to have dinner with them and talk to them and all that. You go out and you're going to have, you know, I went to somebody's house every night that I was there. You were, you were gonna you're gonna talk. It was gonna be hours long, and you were gonna have a conversation, and then they were gonna be your friends for life. Uh, and so, um, hospitality is just part of the culture. You don't you don't um, make short shrift of of, of hospitality. Um, and when you go to somebody's house, uh, uh, there are introductions that have to be made, and everybody has to be introduced to everybody and and it's a very formal process uh, and um, and so even if you just go to somebody's house there's a whole kind of ceremony of of having a feast with them there's gift giving there's there's uh, uh, lauds that have to be given to everybody everybody has to feel included and um, and so it's a it's different than just going over to somebody's house and 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 just having dinner or lunch with them it's going to be three or four hours that you're going to be at their house and there's going to be a kind of a, a protocol of hospitality that has to uh, you have to go through. So, mm -hmm. so it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a very warm culture in the sense that they want to know who you are. Um, part of what he said to me was, when you come over here, that's Emmanuel, my friend, he said just kind of roll with the punches and, 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 and just be engaged with them and they're going to be so happy that you're there. You know, it's very hard, not only because it costs a lot, but it's very hard to get from Tanzania to come here. And so, um, so a lot of them want to come here and they want to study and they want to learn English. Um, but as I've told many of you, the, the language situation in Tanzania is, is, is complicated to say the least. Um, on the one hand, I would say that 95% of the country is fluent in Swahili. There's probably a few places where people are not fluent and 
it's, I think the Maasai are not totally fluent in, in uh, Swahili. They are pretty steadfast about speaking Maasai. Um, but most of the other people are speaking Swahili. Uh, but it's not, it's everybody's first language, but it's, it's everybody's primary language, but it's, but it's very few people's first language. You got, so it's everybody's primary language, but it's, but it's actually very few people's first language. So most people are speaking a tribal language, and then the language that they use for commerce and just every day is, is, is Swahili, but when they're talking to their friends and family from their village, they're talking in, in their tribal language. The tribal language there is, is called Kiha. Ki just means language. Any of the Bantu languages, you'll see Ki something or other. Ki just means language. And then Ha is the name of the tribe. So Kiha, the language of the, of the, the Ha people. So that's the name of the tribe there. Um, so uh, for me, uh, I was nervous, as you can imagine, about communicating to people. And um, most of the children who are between, I would say, six and about 16 are somewhat fluent in English. And I use that disclaimer, somewhat fluent in, in English. Because uh, now what's happening is that most of the schools, beginning with ninth grade or thereabout, um, are all done in English. Some of the schools now are, are, are starting earlier with English. And I don't mean like here, like, oh, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Polk uh, Central and I'm going to be studying Spanish for one, one hour a day. No, all your classes are in, in, in English. So, so what is happening is that more and more of the education is actually happening in English. And Still, uh, a lot of what happens in the government happens in English, and so it's a very, it's kind of a a strange dichotomy linguistically where um, everybody's first language, by and large, is not used officially. Everybody's <coughs> primary language is spoken on the streets, and everybody knows it. And there are, is some some news and some, some media <coughs> in Swahili, but everybody's trying to speak English. Now the problem is you have a whole country of people who don't really know how to speak English trying to teach one another how to speak English. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit like when, when I, well, my age and, and older, so all of you, that, that when you, you went to high school and you were learning Latin and nobody really knew how to speak Latin or, or and not even the teacher really said so you were learning kind of hackneyed Latin. Um, well, that's kind of what I, you go there and they'll be talking to you in English and you'll be going, that's not English. Um, it, it, those are English words, but that's not English. Um, and uh, uh, my friend Emmanuel is well aware of this issue. He's totally fluent in English, and he has two master's degrees over here. So he's very fluent in English, and he's trying to teach his, his teachers how to speak better English, uh, because they're really... They know just enough English to kind of get themselves in trouble with the English language. Um, and so all of the seminary is in, is in English. And part of that reason is because there are no materials. There's no theological materials uh, beyond basic Bibles and, and some very basic catechumenal materials in Swahili. What you have are materials in English. And there's plenty of materials in the Anglican Communion in English. And he said, the other thing, too, is, he says, look, if you're going to be a, an Anglican priest, everything in the Anglican Communion happens in English. He says, this isn't, this isn't the Roman church where everything's happening in Latin and Italian. This is a church where everything internationally is happening in English. And he says, if you're going to be kind of versed in what's going on theologically and socially in the Anglican Communion. Really knowing English is really how you have to go. And so he's kind of struggling to get that seminary up and running in a way where English is being used in a real fluent sort of way. Um, it's kind of well, uh, since the British occupied Tanzania yeah. at one point, 
uh, the elderly people, because it's my age, do they speak Well, so that's English? a really good question, and the answer is no. And the reason is that a very strange thing happened in Tanzania, is that they were originally not an English colony. Originally, they were a German colony. And so they were actually only an English colony for about 25 to 30 years. So they were a German colony for about 65 years. And the, the colonial <coughs> architecture you see there is actually German colonial architecture because the British weren't there very long to make kind of a deep, lasting impression. So... Um, well, 25, 30 years. Maybe yeah, that's but, but what happened was this. It was between <coughs> World War I and World War II. People saw World War II coming. The English weren't really there during World War II. They were in other places during World War II. Right. So basically, everybody left, all the English left Tanzania. And, and so basically, the English were really only there in name only because they had been ceded this territory of, of, of Tanganyika uh, uh, as part of the Versailles Treaty after World War I. So they, they, didn't, they weren't really there long enough to make a real, what I would call, linguistic and cultural impression. And the good news is this, is that they don't really have a lot of hatred or animosity to the English because they just didn't see a lot of the English. <laughs> so, so, well, I, I think that I would say that, that that generation is already dead and buried. So people look around, oh, yeah, the Germans built that over there. Don't remember much of them, but yeah, they built that. And no, oh, yeah, that's the, you know. So a lot of like police stations are still in German buildings. Um, it's great to have the Germans come and build stuff for you, isn't it? Uh, um, so the stuff is really good. It, but the, the issue is that just north of the border in Kenya and in Uganda, the English were there for a very long time. And, and especially in Kenya, the English moved there. And the reason was that much of the central plateau of Kenya is in a very temperate zone where you can grow coffee and tea and they had big plantations. And so you saw a really big impact in Kenya with English. So you can go to Nairobi and you go to a lot of places in Kenya and they're speaking English all over the place. Um, it's, it's, you know, in the southeast of Kenya is where Swahili is big, but the further you move north up to Nairobi, the more the kind of lingua franca becomes English. And in Uganda, they pride themselves on their English. And I, I've never been to Uganda, so I don't know. I'm, I, I don't know. Their whole educational system in Uganda is from day one in English, and everybody there is supposedly fluent in English. I, I don't know how much I buy that, though, given how much I heard people's English in, in Tanzania. Uh, um, I, I might say that it, their, their English is a little rough. Uh, but... So, having said all of that, as I said to you the other day, uh, two weeks ago or a week ago, um, what people love to give as gifts is fabric. And the reason they love to give gifts of fabric is twofold. You don't have to worry about getting somebody the wrong size. Um, you can let them figure out the size. Um, although people did get me shirts, and I'm really glad they got me shirts, and the reason I'm glad they got me shirts is it's a lot cheaper to make a shirt there than it is here. So this shirt, these shirts probably cost them $10, which for somebody in, in, in Tanzania is a lot of money. Who makes the fabric? So the fabric comes from all over Africa. Um, but a lot of the fabric that you see there comes from Congo, from the, the Congo, which is just on the other side. It looks factory made. Though. Yes, they have factories in Congo, but they're... they're it, the Congo is a bit like the upstate of South Carolina. Uh, there are mills all over the place, from what I've, I've been told. And part of the reason was that they had um, lots of rivers there. So they had, they had, for a long time, they had mills uh, on the rivers, uh, the big rivers in the Congo. So that's where you get a lot of the fabric. But they put this wax on there because, as I said before, the wax keeps the fabric 
so that you can wipe the, the dust off of it. Because the, the stores don't, they're not stores. I'll show you some pictures of them. They're just, they look like a closet. The closet doors open, and then there is stuff that's being hung all over the place. And so, um, uh, this is called a katangi, and this is called a kanga. The kanga, as you see, is more rough and um, is uh, more of a uh, unfinished fabric than the others are. And the, what they'll usually have is a biblical image or a natural image and then something about God's grace on the, on the bottom. Um, and that's what all of these have. Yeah, and you but will see... That all, first one you gave me is double weave, which should be much more... No, the, the yellow yeah. and blue one. Oh, yeah. But th and that should be much more expensive to make. This is that's, not. That, that is. That's much more expensive. And that is. This is much more expensive yeah, than right. this. That's right. So you're, you're right about that. But, but people will wear this as, women wear these as skirts. Yeah. Women will wear those as skirts. Okay. Are these cotton? Or, I mean, yeah, some of them are like cotton, linen. cotton, linen. Yeah, that, that one's so. yeah. Or the dresses that uh, Cheryl and Jen wore uh, made for them? Yes, they were, but they had to guess. Um, and so Emmanuel kept asking me, could you send me pictures of your family? And so he's now how old are they? Is your daughter tall for seven? And I kept what are you asking me all these questions for? And I found out it was because he was trying to get he was trying to get them uh, dresses. Cheryl's dress is a little bit more to her size. Jenna will have a few years to grow into her dress. <laughs> um, but but you know you just take it for what it is. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you some pictures. Um, um, the name of the thing is called yeah. Tanzanite. Yeah, and do they mine that? Yes, they do. It's not, it's not a huge thing, but it's down in the southern part of it, far away from where I am. Okay, so this... This is the compound that I was staying at. There's a gazebo in the middle where we had our meals. Um, and then this, these are the people who were kind of in charge of our hospitality with Krina and Agnes. All right, you can get All right, now this is my driver, Caleb. Uh, and Caleb uh, drives like a crazy man on these roads. Like I said, there are no, there's no paved roads. He was driving 50 miles an hour and I was yes. hanging on for dear life. One of the things that you'll see is that almost all of the cars, there are Toyota Land Cruisers, and they're all, Toyota is still making Toyota Land Cruisers that are the identical tricks that they rolled off from 40 years ago. And the reason is simple. They built these to last forever. Uh, there is, they're all analog. You roll up the windows, you push the lock up and down, and it's a five-speed manual with a, a turbo diesel that will never break. So uh, they build they build these so that things will never break. And seat belts are very optional in in Tanzania. Safety is optional in Tanzania. Okay. All right. That's so this is what like the, one of the trucks looks like. Are the runways uh, paved? Yes, but not paved like you would know. One so way singular. They are they are very rough. Like, because I had to step out onto them, it, it's it's not like a smooth pavement. It's much more of like um, like our like our parking lot. Um, so, um, so, but it's flat, unlike our parking lot. Uh, this is a manual, and he's in the big market. And the market there is Friday and Saturday is when most of the people are there, and it is just a zoo, and you can buy whatever you want there so long as it is uh, garlic, onions, pineapples, <laughs> peas, papayas, ba bananas, and avocados. You can buy whatever you want so long as it's one of those. Uh, so, all right, that's me in the market. Uh, all right, this is, uh, these were the priests that were at the cathedral uh, the Sunday that I preached at. Um, and uh, that's, that's my friend Emmanuel. Uh, that is uh, Ephraim, and uh, that is Daniel, and uh, I can't remember those two guys' names. Uh, but he's the he's the he's the dean of the cathedral. 
to the services. All right. Yeah. So, Anglican, yes, they are. We would recognize the. Yes and no. We have uh, a dance with chicken. So, <laughs> so one of the things, this is a great question. One of the things is, um, they're, they're old school evangelical Anglicans. What do we mean by that? They're doing morning prayer. Um, most of Sundays and the fourth Sunday of the month, they're doing uh, Eucharist, like we do, like we did here 40, 50 years ago. However, I'm going to ask you, you can all kind of give me your, your, your answer. How long do you think a morning prayer service would last there? <laughs> Three hours. Okay, that's your guess. Anybody else got a guess? Yeah. Are you preaching? Uh, I was preaching. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, now, now it was three and a half hours. Uh, so, so I said to I said to Emmanuel on my first Sunday, I said, "Oh well, what time are we going to church tomorrow?" Six thirty is when church begins. And he said, "By the way, you're preaching tomorrow." <laughs> okay, all right. Um, uh, and um, I guess I didn't get the rota. Uh, so, so. We get there at 6, we're on the way, and we get there at 6.25. I'm like, we're, we're not going to be ready for this service. He said, don't worry, you'll be plenty early for this service. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, time is a relative concept here. It's kind of a movable thing. And, um, and so we, we, got, we got there at 6.25, and, and as we we're pulling, I said, well, how many people are going to be? Oh, well, there'll be 1,000 adults and 500 children here. Um, I said, really? And then we were lining up. I look in the church, and I'm like, there's barely 100 people here. He said, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So he said, besides, you're not preaching until 8.30 anyway. I said, 8.30? <laughs> <laughs> you know, he says, don't worry about that. So, so they have a Book of Common Prayer, and it's very much like our Book of Common Prayer, except it's in Swahili, and it has some indigenous stuff to it. But, you know... Once you start getting the flow of it, you realize, oh yes, you know, there's, there's, it, it, morning prayer is identical on the page to our morning prayer. The difference is on the page. Um, so everything that's on the page will, will eventually be said, but there will be lots of other stuff said and sung. So, so, like the cathedral has four choirs. But choirs are much more about leading people in dance than they are in singing. Um, at this particular service, they had, they had drums and guitars and, and bass guitar and, and, and um, uh, keyboard. You can't have an organ there. Nobody would know how to fix it, and it would, it would break. And all. I mean, so you use the instruments that you're going to be able to, to play and keep up and but all that. They would that. be at home in many services in this country now, wouldn't they? Well, so, so here's the thing. The services, now this is a great question, are going to be all in churches. But, now here's the thing. Um, in the last five years, they have started uh, ten churches each year. And they're going to, over the next five years, they're going to start ten more churches. And they start each church under a tree. And over the next year, they build the first church. And the first church, you'll see pictures of it, is basically like just a wooden fence with a mud floor or, or a dirt floor and a tin roof. And then they, because they're not going to invest a lot in that, because they're going to spend the next three years after that building the real church which will be next to it. So they go from the tree to a makeshift church to a, a big kind of church. So they start off doing it under a tree. And, um, and they've kind of figured out the process of how to do that. Um, uh, as, so as I said, I think to Paul earlier, they have 50,000 children in their diocese in uh, 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 12 and under in Sunday school. I mean, it's just... Kind of mind boggling. I wouldn't know how you would you would deal with a Sunday school of 500 kids or something like that. But 50, they do. Uh, 50,000? 50,000 kids and throughout the diocese. Those are school. all Episcopalians. Those are all, yeah, they're all Anglicans, which Episcopalians, but the, the, the church there is the Anglican Church of Tanzania. The diocese is a diocese of western Tanganyika because they're right up against Lake Tanganyika 
which is the big lake that is on the western border of Tanganyika, of Tanzania, and, and then borders with uh, uh, the Congo. So. Now, is the, what are the other religions that are significant? How about uh, the Catholics? And um, well, in this region, the Catholics, there's not, there's not a lot of Catholics. No. Uh, I would say 85% um, of the, the, the um, population is, is Anglican mm -hmm. in this area. And I'd say 10% of that's Muslim, and 5% of that is other types of Christians, Lutherans, uh, Pentecostals, Don't whatever. They have their own tribal religion. Well, that? not really there anymore. They, but what they've done, and this is what I was going to say, is some of the <coughs> some of the ritual has worked its way into the, the liturgy of the people there. The dances, for instance, if you want to give praise. If you want to give thanksgiving, if you want to uh, uh, show repentance, all of those dances uh, basically have been borrowed from the, 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 the culture of the tribe. So, you know, when they sing a hymn about, when they sing something, they're going to dance it too. And so they dance a song of thanksgiving or dance a song of, of um, repentance or dance a song of, of gratitude, whatever. Uh, they didn't just invent that dance for this morning. It wasn't like they all came and said, "We're just gonna, we're gonna fall out of bed, and we have a choreographer, and the choreographer is going to, 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 to teach us a new dance." They know what they'll say. Okay, this song is is a praise song, or this song is about Jesus, and so we would dance these particular dances. And so there is some borrowing from 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 kind of the indigenous uh, religion. But it, it takes more in the expression of how they're doing Christianity. So, so one of the things that you realize is that, you know, if we tried to do dance here, you know, like let's say Paul and I were the liturgical dance team, right? <laughs> we would be, we'd be doing it, right? And we'd be doing the dance. And that would be okay if we were good dancers. But all of you would just be watching us dance kind of going, huh? What's that about, right? And what you realize there is that everybody is dancing. So women and men who are in their 80s are dancing too. The same day, are they dancing well? They're, well, you know, you can tell. You can tell that they grew up dancing. You can tell that everybody there grew up dancing. And there's music. And there's music. And so we will see some of these videos. Well, that sounds like some Pentecostal churches in this country. Except, and this is the difference, except that they are doing dances that express a certain theological idea. So this is not, this is not like somebody's just moving because I'm in the okay. spirit. They have said, okay, this is the dance we do for this type of song. So if, if you have, and the, the best way I can kind of say this is, you, you can't really see it in our prayer book, but in the Hebrew Bible, when you see the Psalms, they all are marked with a certain type of, of expressiveness, mm -hmm. sorrow or loss or whatever, and then there is a certain type of music and dance that you're supposed to do with that in, in kind of the, the Hebrew Psalms. So, I'm going to show you some pictures of this, okay? Uh, please don't laugh. Yes, Neil? The, the dance yeah. is an interpretive dance like American Indian. Right. Very much like Very that. Much like Very that. much like that. Very much like that. You're you're exactly right. So they've taken a dance, <laughs> and so you'll hear rhythms and you'll hear things, and those are taken from their culture. Now, one of these dances you'll see was dance to Rock of Ages, but the that's the words were Rock of Ages, but the music is not our Rock of Ages because I said, oh, it's Rock of Ages. Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was all ready to sing Rock of Ages in Swahili. Now, one of the good things about Swahili, I, I will say, is that uh, there are certain sound sounds, consonant sounds especially, that we don't have, like MKs and NGs and stuff like that, that just are not native to our sound system. But it, you say what's on the page. So, one letter, one sound. It's really straightforward, even when you have a, a, a word that's 30 letters long, you just keep saying the letters as they appear. It's not like English where you're like, I don't know. Uh, you, you know, you're on your own there, you know. <laughs> it's kind of like English is kind of 
guess guess at the spelling and the pronunciation, right? They kind of two don't always go in in, in line because they. I know a lot of them are like, what? Why does this word not sound like this word? And, and the two, you know what? They are always complaining about English spelling. I said, well, you got stand in a long line of people complaining about English spelling. He said, well, you should have Swahili spelling. I said, yeah, you're probably right. But we don't. So, so <laughs> this is this is Father Ephraim and his family, his wife Amina and his uh, uh, six children. A couple of his children are at uh, boarding school right now. And there I am with them. <coughs> okay. Yeah. And there is Hoppy and, and, and Bill Keller. I bet you didn't know that they went to Africa. Yes. Hoppy, I forgot you were there with me. That's amazing, isn't it? All right. So I took a picture of this. This is a church that was started this la last year. And you can see, oh, uh -huh. you can see the wood, and they have a little corrugated metal with a cross on it and everything, and a and a loudspeaker. Got it's one thing you got, you, you know, no matter how new the church is, there's gonna be a really loud sound system. I don't <laughs> care if they just built that church last week; they're gonna have a sound system, and you're gonna be able to hear that service from miles away. No and I mean, yeah, you see where the you see where the loudspeaker is. It ain't facing in toward the congregation. Um, you're gonna leave. You're gonna leave a service going whoa. And part of the reason I know this sounds kind of crazy. Part of the reason is that well, first of all, it, well, that's right. You gotta let people know. But what? What do the Muslim mosques do? Uh, do? Right. Call prayer. Call, prayer. Call prayer. Well, you know we're going to do it even louder. Uh, that's the yes. first place I've ever seen Anglicans say, well, we're going to do it louder. Uh, but they take that seriously. So they, you know, I, I got woken up at 4.50 in the morning for the Muslims praying. Really? Oh, what is would they shut up? And, um, and no, no, not at all. They, they, they're and well. So come Sunday morning, the Anglicans are going to do it even louder. So, so yeah. So even though you can see there's 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 um, the blue kind of tent structure like and and wood all the way around, um, and and this will the church next to it is about a year away from being really in, inhabitable. Unlike in America, you will see houses and structures in all phases of kind of being built and people kind of using the structure even while it's in process. Okay. How many people can get into in, in that structure? Uh, I would say about 400. All right. Yeah. Okay, this is me in, in uh, uh, the Canon to the Ordinary's house. We're all dancing there. And um, and so this this girl's name is Felista, and Jonathan and uh, Maria, and uh, they are they are uh, the children of uh, uh, Father David, uh, who is the canon to the ordinary. But David over there is pronounced Dowdy, and it comes from the uh, comes more from the Arabic. So there I am again. Again, again, again. Okay, now I want to take some pictures because I wanted you to see what this looked like. Mm -hmm. Now you see this roof over here? Mm -hmm. Looks rusty, right? Yes. It's not. It's, not. it's just it's dust. dust. It's it's about a half inch of dust. Imagine, imagine what some of the places in South Carolina that have that color dust look like back in in the 30s and 40s. Um, well, this is kind of this is kind of like. Um, Tobacco Road, where road where you have all this clay, this red orange clay dust all over the place, and so the roofs, the cars, everything is covered in that, and my shoes are still recovering from from being there. Um, so you can see what the buildings are like. This building back here, which is being still built on the fourth sto story, people are working and have shops in the lower uh, part of that, even though. The building is still being built up high, so, and you can see the great road structures here. <laughs> and uh, my my friend Emmanuel says, um, every four years there's an election here, and every four years the 
party in power tells you that this will be the four years that they will build all the roads. And the party that's not in power will tell you that if you vote them into office, they will build all the roads for you. Sounds a lot like America, right? So, uh, South Carolina, that's right. Hey, look, you know it's good to have eternal hope for something. Uh, so, so I took a lot of these because, you know, there wasn't a lot of there weren't a lot of wow photos of just things. It wasn't like, I, you know, St. Louis and take the arch or New York and you take pictures of, of the Statue of Liberty or, or the Empire State Building. This is kind of what you get there. And you can see th these are really beat up roads and, and the, the, the stores and everything are kind of beat up. So they drive like the English exactly. or the Americans? English. They drive like the English. Mm -hmm. so, so it's kind of weird. You kind of... I don't know if, how many of you been, how many of you have been to England or some place where they drove? You know, you spend the first three days going, whoa, whoa, what are you doing? No, whoa, right? You know, and you kind of have to get used to, you know, being on, and it takes about 72 hours before you stop flinching because you're not on the wrong side of the road. That's a manual there. You can see how... I mean, it, what happens to those roads in the rainy season? Um, he says, he said right to me, now? You wouldn't believe the roads and the rainy season. If you think they're bad now, he said, they've just become kind of a morass, basically. But you see, it's worse than just mud because they're clay. So it gets sticky. It gets all over the place, right? It doesn't just get like you can wipe it off. So he said, you should be thankful that it's only dusty right now and it's not sticky right now. So this is, this is the big... This is a big market. There's uh, there's a parking lot and, and everything right there. Um, well, I, w I took a picture of this for two reasons. One, the motorcycle. There are motorcycles everywhere. Everywhere. Uh, and part of the reason is that the roads are so bad that it's easier to get around on a motorcycle than it is on a car because you can kind of avoid all of the potholes mm -hmm. on a motorcycle. If you'll notice, though, this motorcycle is only a one, 125. All the motorcycles are either 125 or 150s because, um, well, first of all, they use less gas. Second of all, you really can't go that fast because of all the people. You just see people and motorcycles going in and out and all that. There are no Harleys. No Harleys. <laughs> and, and, and the other issue is just the cost of gas is so expensive. This is a country where there are no gas uh, and oil reserves. So all the, they have to import all that. So you're talking about like a gallon of gas would be ten dollars. Mm -hmm. Well, how can they afford it? Because you you ride in a motorcycle that gets you about 150 miles to the gallon. Oh, okay. That's how they afford it. So what language is on the sign? Is that Swahili? That's Swahili. Hudamiwa Hapa. So you say it's it like. Hapa gas. No. Oh. Um, <laughs> this is a store, and uh, actually. Besides books. There are two types of advertising in, in Tanzania. Coca-Cola, thank you Peter Franklin, um, and, and cell phones. Uh, so you see, you see cell phone advertising all over the place. Now this gets back to what you had asked earlier. I said if you want infrastructure, don't go to Tanzania. There is really only one type of infrastructure there, and that is cell phones. And the reason is, it takes very little to build cell phone towers, right? You build a cell phone tower, they build them on the, on the, the hills and the mountains all around. They've, you just look from town and you kind of go like this and there's cell phone towers kind of all over the place. Um, great reception in the middle of nowhere of Africa, right? They've got... And and, um, and yet we don't have any. Well, that's right. They, they, <laughs> they should come here. Yeah. So, so you've got a lot of electricity, except when you get into the small towns. Uh, but in Kisulu town, there's there's plenty of electricity. But way out, there still is. Yeah, there's. I mean, you wouldn't believe how way out some of these way out villages are. I mean, it's really like it's like way out. It's yeah. There's there's nothing there. <laughs> but you know? they still have electricity. Yeah. I think it's amazing. Well, so what will happen is we went to a wedding there, in a village <clears throat> that was about three hours out into the bush, and 
Um, I think, where are we going? Like, we're, on, we're literally on a cow path here. We're trying not to bump into cows. The cows have the big long horns, you know, and I'm like, either we're dying or a cow is dying here. Um, and we, we get there, and I said to I said, a man, we get to the village, and we're sitting there. I said, you said the wedding was at 1.30. He said, yeah, but it'll probably start at 3. Um, so so, so we, we, we're sitting by this church, and, and we're just talking and everything. Okay, he said, well, they said they're ready now. So, so I said, where? Where is there? And he says, oh, we, we've got to drive about 10 minutes more into the bush so we can all get back in the land cruiser and we go. And we're in the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden, there's thousands of people. Thousands of people. Well, where, where did all these people come from? Who, who, there's nothing around here. How did these people get here? We're the only ones with a car. How did all these people get here? Oh, they've been walking for days for the, to this. And, um, and we get there, and there's probably 3,500 people. And there is a house no bigger than this room. There is a there's a cow pen over here, and there's a huge dance floor in front of it, and the music is like at eleven. It's just like <laughs> and then everybody everybody's down. Yeah, you can hear it from miles away, and and there's cows. There's a little shack. <laughs> there is a sound system, a dance floor, and a generator. Oh, and that's how they got their that's how they got their electricity. Was they had this big Honda generator. And so. lots of fun. And lots of fun. And we ate, and we ate, and we ate. Okay. So you'll see motorcycles all over the place. Motorcycles are called Picky Picky. Uh, so you can just see <laughs> Picky Picky. And the reason is, what does a 125 motorcycle sound like? Picky 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 Picky. picky, 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 picky. <laughs> well, what is it? It's a Picky Picky. <laughs> <laughs> was, I, I, at first I was like, well, why is it a picky picky? He said, well, listen to it. <laughs> and you can see the market here. This is, a, this is the Saturday market and just, just goes for as far as the eye can see. It's amazing. This is the, this is the school of theology there. And you can see the buildings and the shrubs. And there, that is, a, those are, those are, um, <laughs> so, that's so, a solar power, but the problem with the solar panel, what do you think the problem with the solar panel is? Dust. 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 Dust, that's right. So you come and you sweep it off, and then the next morning you wake up and there's a half inch of dust. So, yeah. Now, this building right here is the computer room over here, and you actually have to take your shoes off, and they give you slippers because they don't want you dragging the dust into the computer room. So they kind of have this screen, and then, yeah, it's a clean room. It's like you're going into operation or whatever. So, so yeah. Are all the shrubs trimmed by hand there? Uh, They're yes, dirty. because there's no... That's there, right. There's no... Nobody's going around with a, uh, right. electrical tools. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. that's right. Mm -hmm. And it's exactly right. Now, um, I'm going to get Paul on this because this really does need to be re-landscaped. Um, okay. <laughs> Barry, you're coming with me. Paul, you're coming with me. You bring the roses, you'll, you'll get the grass all square away. Okay. 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 Yeah, that's, that's right. All right, no, so this is the parish of Matiazzo, okay? And so, so you can see the tile work that's done up here. It's really quite impressive. But I want, to, I want you to see is this fabric behind here. Somebody asked me, they said, well, are there stained glass windows? And are there, what, what, what are there? What is there there? And I said, well, stained glass windows would be really hard because there's very little glass there. I mean, it's just, it, to have glass in your windows is just a luxury that almost nobody has. And, um, and so, uh, you don't, they don't paint on the walls, fancy paint. Uh, uh, what they have is fancy fabric. So fabric, what I realized, once again, fabric is the symbol of, of kind of luxury or, or wealth. And so every, they change the fabrics based on the seasons and they have an elaborate way of doing it. So, so in churches, the other thing is this church here is huge. It's enormous. I mean, we, we drove four and a half hours in the mountains. We're about three miles from Burundi here. 
Um, and Burundi has a civil war going on. Um, so it was kind of crazy. They have an orphanage at this church because of the civil war going on in Burundi because of so many of the orphans uh, from uh, coming across the border from, from Burundi. So they have an orphanage, we'll see some of the pictures, that have probably about 200 kids at, uh, at this orphanage. They're at about 5,000 feet above sea level there. They're really up in the mountains. And you, know, you talk about going to Africa. When we got there, it was probably it was probably about 45 degrees, and we were in the clouds, and it was it was really cold there. So um, I was glad I had my sports coat on there. Um, uh, this is uh, this is uh, Lamek, and Lamek is um, he is the the rector of that, and he's the archdeacon of that area, basically like um, the dean of the area. So uh, he's a neat guy. This is his associate, um, and this is Joram, who is the teaches pastoral care at the seminary. And he, Joram went with us because he went to seminary with Lamech, and he wanted a ride to go up and, and be able to see him because he doesn't get to see him a lot because it's a four, four and a half, five hour drive. So, so that's why Joram came with us. Uh, Joram's pretty funny. Uh, and then uh, uh, this is, they're building even more space. This is the hospital for up there. It has about 40 rooms, and they want to add about 20 more rooms. Uh, and they have a they have a couple of doctors, but the head doctor is is a German doctor. Doctor, it's a woman, Doctor Uta, uh, and uh, she walks around like a German the whole time. <laughs> it's, it's very strange. Like it's very strange. She does not fit there. Uh, okay, so this this is Maria, and Maria is the head of the orphanage, and this is her her. Uh, uh, first in, uh, first assistant there. And there's probably about uh, 15, 20 ladies who help run the, this orphanage. And let me tell you, uh, Maria has learned from the Germans because that, that place is as clean as anywhere. That orphanage is the cleanest place in all of Tanzania. Um, you, can, you won't find a spot anywhere. So, uh, and then here is a picture of... of one of the rooms with how big of a uh, community? I mean, how many people live around there? Um, I'm still struggling to figure this out because people would just appear out of nowhere. I mean, I I thought like we're in the middle of nowhere, right? We're like on a mountain in the middle of nowhere. I go to the church. And how many people is it? Thirty five hundred. Oh yeah, it's full every Sunday. I was like. <laughs> <laughs> where, where are these people coming from? Because I don't see, I saw like 12 houses on the way here. So uh, where are all these people coming from? Connie, that's a great question. I'm still trying to figure it out. But you see very few houses from the road. And, and that's part of the issue is I, we'll be going and we're on a cow path. Nobody built their house right next to a cow path. It's just where the cow was going. Well, you, the only road was on the cow path. So it's very, it, it was very hard for me to visualize where a, a, a lot of the villages were. Villages are away from roads, and, and, and that's part of the issue that they're trees. having. A lot of trees, a lot of trees. Not always. In the mountains there are trees because you get more rain and you get more clouds, but what you'll see are two types of trees. You'll see banana trees and you'll see pineapple trees. And then you'll have coffee, up, up in Matiazzo is coffee and tea. Uh, so, because once you hit about over 4,500 feet, then you can start growing coffee and tea. Below that, it, it's, it, the weather isn't good for it. This is it good coffee? Um, they don't drink coffee there. They don't. They don't drink yeah, almost nice any coffee. coffee. You go across the border into Kenya, and everybody's yeah. drinking yeah. coffee. In Tanzania, yeah. you get tea. But... Tea. Is it hot or cold? It's it's hot. You don't get anything cold there. No uh, ice tea. No iced tea. There's no refrigeration. No, 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 no. So you get hot tea that is like that tastes, at least to me, it tasted like southern iced tea, sweet tea, and I was like, ugh, I got my own tea. Thank you very much. Because this was it was really more drinking sugar, hot sugar water with a little bit of, of tea. Kind of like southern iced tea. So, okay, so this is right behind us, if you go down that hill, is the, is the uh, border with Burundi. 
So we're right at the border, and you can see the mountains up there are in the clouds. Uh, the mountains go up to about 7,000, feet at the border. Um, those are some of the mountains around Kasulu. Kasulu, yeah, keep going. All right. That is, that is Mama Ella's, uh, that's Mama Ella's family, and that's Ella, obviously. That is Ephraim, uh, and he was just in the picture because he was with me at that point in time. All right. Now that's Peter, and um, <coughs> Peter's, Peter's family owns a, a fabric shop, go figure. And um, <laughs> so Peter says to me, uh, he says, um, Robert, we should have shirts made. And I said, you're right, let's get shirts made. We could be twins, Robert. <laughs> Peter, if you think so, we could be twins. <laughs> uh, this is what some of the stores look like. You can see here is where one store begins, here's where another store. <coughs> so really you'd have like about this much between the shops and there's alleys and stuff. Um, so kind of neat. Yes. Uh, this is Father Ephraim, and, and, and I got him a piece of fabric. He loves blue, so I got him a, a blue piece of fabric. And this is me oh, looking really, really ridiculous in that shirt. Is that, is that, is that a golf shirt? Like barefoot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Dick, I think you look great in this shirt. Oh, yeah. It's a nice shirt. It, it is. I didn't All right. he was pigeon toe. Yeah. Um, oh, this, wow. this is uh, Arasto Musa. He's the English professor there. He's got excellent English. He's reading Hamlet right now under my advice. Uh, so. I'm trying to confuse. This is see. This is what it looks like. It's just a lot of brush and shrub. It, uh, the what I said most of it looks like is West Texas. Yeah. I mean, it looks yeah. kind of like West Texas during the the, the Dust Bowl. Oh, it, see, they're building a road here, right. uh, but the road is still being built. So we were going on this nonsense over here. How long has it been? Like that? Where do they get their Years. water from? That's uh, a great question. Um, so. So during the rainy season, what you will see is that a lot of people have these big cisterns on each corner of their house. And so during the storms, all of that rain rolls off their house and into their cisterns. And so a lot of them are storing up uh, rainwater for, from the whole year. And that's what they drink? A, a lot, yep. When you had all the dust up? Yeah, that's why it comes out of the tap. Yeah. yeah, they yeah. drink yeah. to wash their clothes. Yeah. Um, yes, so when you want your clothes washed, they're going to be washed by hand. There's no, no washing machine, and they might come back a little dirtier than they were before. So, so you, you want your clothes to be really dirty before you ask for them to be washed. Yes, Meg? Um, you said there is a population of Maasai in, yes. in Tanzania, yeah. the, and obviously they are cattle... Cattlemen. They are. You said there's no refrigeration. Is the meat all exported, or is it? Yeah. Or um, is it sold within the country? And it, no, what happens? There's a cow. Kill the cow. Put it on the table. Eat it. Right. And you eat and everything. So, so it's a big barbecue. It's a big. Bar <laughs> and a, well, a lot of the a lot of the meat there is is boiled or stewed. Um, and I don't know if you've had boiled meat, but yeah. it's pretty chewy. Yeah. Um, and um, and I wish they barbecued more of the meat. I had barbecued goat with a, with a lime uh, vinaigrette, and that was fantastic. Um, but they, 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 they boil much of their meat, which cooks the meat, but doesn't make it particularly tasty. But they don't and have much water. Why would they boil it? They're stewing it. They're stewing it in, in those, uh, so they like they, do, they don't do land oven uh, where they dig a hole, line it with yes, hot but rocks. They, that they are doing that, but they have a cauldron of kind of like a tomato stew, and they've got all of the the meat in there too. We must dry it. Yeah, as I, well. Go ahead, Bart Barry. Uh, I've been listening and watching, and I don't see a parallel to what I experienced in West Africa which is a lot of villages along the road, yeah, and a lot of uh, uh, labor activity So in, in the fields. But my point, my point there was that women in West Africa, the French-speaking West Africa, in Ghana, uh, they do 90% of the work. They work in the fields, they'll have a baby, they would be strapped, yeah. they're out there 24 hours later or less, continue to do that, 
and they bring, they carry big gourds yes. of water on their heads, so, so you're and, they, and they go out and put a mile and carry uh, firewood every day. Yeah. While the guys, yeah. the guys sit around in the shade, uh, <laughs> chew it on, on kakawa uh, sticks. And, you forgot and the back end. Point, point their fingers in the air yeah. and, 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 and talking, you know, politics and whatever. Yeah. And, that, and playing backgammon. Yeah. Did you ever see yeah. anything? Yes. They're analogous. The women carry, they carry these massive burdens yeah. on their heads. Yeah. Okay. And I, I, but they just walk like this, like yes. it's nothing. Yes. And they're walking on, on clay roads on the side of them, and they're getting out of the way of motorcycles and cars, mm -hmm. and they're, <laughs> they got a forty-five pound weight on their head, and they're just going like this, and. No hands ever go up. They never like. Oh well, what about that? And and you never see a man carrying a big heavy object. So, uh, yeah, they're driving trucks. Uh, right. And the women same are same in Kenya carrying. too. Women yeah. 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 So so most of the farm work is done by by women. And see you later, Margie. And um, it is. Uh, I would say that. Um, yeah, probably there's an uneven distribution of, of, of work over there. Yes. Um, but, I, but I also think, and this is the interesting thing, is I think that from what I saw, um, I think that that's going to change. And the reason is um, uh, it seemed like the secondary schools were full of, of young girls. So, so if you ask a young girl, what do you want to do? Uh, she'll tell you she either wants to be a teacher, a doctor, or a lawyer. So it seems like half of the young girls in Tanzania are going to be doctors in 25 years. So um, I think that's I think it's shifting because of education and educational opportunities. Obviously, culture is culture, and it takes time to change. But you know. when you went out, how far from the from the large town did you go out into the? Well, this is the, the bush. The, the bush. Well, we went up to Matiazo, and that okay, was. Did, did you pass any villages on yeah, the way? Yeah, you pass a few villages, but it's not like you don't just see the villages. You see, you'll see like what I realized is you'd see maybe like five or six houses as you went through the village, oh, wow. but the village altogether probably had thousands of people, so they're living in houses you can't see. Miles off the road. What about so, marketplaces so, and whatnot? So, well, we would. Well, I showed you that picture of Matiazzo. We, we, you go through a village and people will be on the side of the road, and you just slow down and everybody comes out there and they've got cucumbers and onions and 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 every, what I realized also is that every village is known for a certain crop. So when we went to Bohigwe, you get pineapple. Because they got the best pineapples in Bohigwe. But you don't buy your onions in Bohigwe because they're, they're no good. Uh, so you just get, and then the next town down, they got good onions over there. So you get your onions at the next town over. But you don't buy your garlic there because your garlic is no good. So they know like where the produce is really good. A bit like we do. Like we'd say, oh, you want those peaches? Go, go to that stand over there. You'll get good peaches. We know where the good produce is here. They know where the good produce is over there. All right, uh, let's move. Let's get to some of the videos. Do, sure. do the farmers own their own land, or is it owned right. by the government? Um, they all own their own land. But there's a caveat, because the land is tribal. So, so, so like, for instance, I went to this one church, and it took them five years to get the deeds to the land straightened out. Because land over there is not individually owned in the same way that it's individually owned here. It's owned not by the government, but corporately by tribes and clans. And so it's very hard to figure out. I, I spent, it seemed like days and days and days having conversations with people about land ownership over there and nobody could really sort it out for me. That's why they need lawyers. Yeah, that's why they yeah, need lawyers. That's why they need very useful. Yeah. 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 All right, good.
before you leave, Patsy, you're going to want to watch this. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. there we go. So now, as you see, see, everybody's doing the same thing. Yeah. It's not like Paul and I are just except jumping around. You. Except me. Except me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dad. We're all in Yeah. See, I'm like five beats behind. <laughs> <laughs> and look at that. You're pranking your page yeah. runway. That's exactly <laughs> yeah. it. So, so this is Father Ephraim. He's the systematics professor there. And Father Ephraim says to me, Robert, go down. They love you dancing. Go down, go down. <laughs> and I said, Are you going? Oh, I'll follow you down there. <laughs> and it, it, it took three minutes to get down there. Is that there. a live orchestra? Um, some of them are, some of them are, and I don't know exactly. Sometimes they want a song and they want to dance to a certain song, so they put it on a. On a, on a CD, so it's a very different understanding of. Right there, you're buying the best. <laughs> yes, 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 <laughs> she says, I want to dance during church. Yeah. Yeah, great time. Yeah. <laughs> I was so sore after the service. My, my knees and feet were killing me. But you have to remember, I was doing this for 15 minutes. That's a cardio workout. <laughs> I should have a tagline. Come to Tanzania. Pray and do cardio. Yes, I do. I gained about five pounds over there because I was eating the whole thing. I see yes. Well, thank you, friend. <laughs> Dr. Fred. <laughs> Like, uh, a Hawaiian, yeah. they had a lot of meaning. <laughs> 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 All right, here we go. Honey, here you go. Here's the rooster. Rooster. <laughs> 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 Father Ephraim, who was here, said, I said, as I'm bringing him up, I said, do you want to hold this rooster? He said, it's not my rooster. It's a real rooster, isn't it? The SPCA no one else is. A rooster represents food. Um, they, they wanted to give me some gifts because I preached there, and so they gave me a rooster, which is a symbol of food, um, like chicken wings. And, and then also they gave me a um, they gave me a ten foot pole of sugar cane, um, so <coughs> something savory, something sweet, um, you know. So, did you so by dancing, are so, you? Are you uh, I, I, at one point, I'm dancing like this with a rooster <laughs> and a sugar cane, so, like this. Yes. So, Don't let the Peter crowd see that. Uh, yeah. Very. Now, now I see the way you were holding that rooster so you know so gently out here yeah. like this. Yeah. Now Arms I know. Slide. Now I know why when he came back, that he hit the ball about fifty yards further. He had that nice loose grip. <laughs> That's right. That nice yeah. loose grip. Yeah. Loose, nice loose grip. That's right. I was so. They're bringing this thing up, and I'm thinking, they're they're not going to give this to me. They're, they're going to give this to me. What do, what do I do with this? And you know, as I said uh, two Sundays ago, I, I don't even like dogs. Uh, and, 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 you know, I like, oh, I do like my dog. Um, yeah, you better say that. Yeah. Um, my point being was, I'm not great with animals. Yes, okay. Did so, yeah, did you bring the chicken back as a support? I animal? can't. You know, Paul. Paul mentioned that as a, as an emotional support. Yeah, rooster. But you know, roosters really aren't interested in your emotional well-being. I realized that they're just interested in waking you up at three thirty in the morning. So, uh, so okay. So um, here is. I'll give you. A, one or two more videos, and then we'll we'll call it a uh, Sunday. That's that.
All right, so <laughs> there I am. Oh man! <laughs> and, uh, I'm, saying, I'm behind the beat the whole time. I'm behind the beat. <laughs> <laughs> was this before or after the rooster? This is before the rooster. But after 30 beers. I think they saw me dancing so vigorously, they knew I needed some nutrients. Robert, I have a personal question. Yeah. Could you stop that for a minute? Have you ever been self-conscious about anything? <laughs> um, yes. Um, but, uh, but... Uh, you know, I, I believe, this is what I was trying to tell you before, I am self-conscious about things, but I, I think, you know, at a certain point, you know, they invite you over there, they're just happy to see you, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I kind of have this, this line of thought, you know, um, you make a fool of yourself for Christ, yeah. and, and you just do it, and, and so, you know, I, I, cause I, I, I think, you know, what they're interested in is, will you come be with us. You know, if you are a, if you're, if you're able to be with us, and you know, I preached at this service. I preached at this service. Once again, this is just like a shack. It's, it's not nothing really more. I mean, it seats 400 people. 6:30 service had about 400 people. The the 10:30 service had uh, 400 people at it. You know, what, are the rest of the people outside? There are people, uh, just, it's just like people because everywhere. He had it at 11 Yeah, yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> so it's not, and you're dancing for joy. Yes, that's absolutely right. Was that the dance for joy with the fans? Yeah, the, this, was a, this was a song of, of thanksgiving. And, and um, you know, I, I say this, you know, they had they had a choir with with little children. Dancing. They had a children. They had a choir with teenagers dancing. They had a they had a choir with ladies who were all over 50 dancing. So everybody is is they're in choirs, and these are not you know it's not like they're yes there is body movement somewhat like a Pentecostal church, but it, it is it is deeply ingrained culturally what they are doing when they are dancing. This is not just like. We're so overcome, we don't know what we're doing. Right. Free, free it's not, it's not a, it, you, like there is one. Or okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go all Sesame Street on you here. One of these kids is doing his own thing, all right? And that kid is me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, everybody else is dancing in union with one another. I, I think, though, you know, to get to your question, um, Dick, I, I think, you know. I think that there are certain, obviously, there are things that I am self conscious about. But, um, you know, going to Tanzania and dancing in front of people or with people, more, more likely, is saying, um, you know, hey, this is great. I enjoy worshiping with you. I get something out of this. People ask me, too, when you were preaching to them, how. How do you preach to them so this makes sense? I said, well, first of all, I got a manual or even <coughs> translating for me. But I said, more than that, um, you know, it, it's about energy and it's about posture and it's about yes. how you convey with your whole being, your visage, your posture, your voice, all of these things. And sharing. And, you know, and so you, you, you know, you, you're you're invested emotionally and spiritually in what you're saying. They get it. And you know, I, and I told them at the beginning, I said, you know, if you hear something you like, you say amen. Right? And I would tell them, okay, come on, I want everybody to say amen. At first they said, one woman said, amen. And I said, okay, come on, we could do better than that. And then the whole church said, amen! <laughs> amen! <laughs> and they got into it. And, and once that started happening, you know, then it's not a lecture. I mean, it's pretty stupid to go over someplace where you don't speak their language, they don't understand you, and give them a lecture. You know, but what, what preaching is more than that. I think everyone in this room knows that. You don't come to church on Sunday morning for a lecture. Uh, you know, uh, we could stay home for lectures, 
Um, but but we go to church to well, be fed. Yes, yeah, <laughs> thank you, Dick. <laughs> so, oh, you don't want to hear that. Julie, hey, yeah. Julie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think you need to invite some of them over and teach us some of those things. Yeah, well, okay, well, the dancing classes. You, yeah. you, you want it, you will get it. Sydney? Uh, I remember growing up as a teenager, I think. But a long time ago, when we were told from the, at the National Cathedral yeah. by, I think, Bishop Angus Brown, yeah. uh, that before long there would be many more Episcopalians and Anglicans in Africa than they were in this country yeah. or even combined, and we all know. Yeah. So there, that's a fact now. Yeah, there, there's, there's about 70 million practicing Anglicans in, in, in Africa. No wow. And how many in this? Yeah. Uh, we got probably, I would say, about 2 million practicing <coughs> Anglicans in Africa. So, so I will tell you, yeah, this diocese, this diocese has a million practicing Anglicans. A million practicing Anglicans. Do you hear that? Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Do we get to camp them in the world? <coughs> yes, we do. Yeah. You have to remember that two thirds of Africa was English. Well, well, well. So, at, so you have, you have, you have the English Africa and you have the French Africa. So that's why you have lots of Catholics and you have lots of you have lots of Anglicans. Um, but, but, you know, I would also say, especially Tanzania, which was had low church uh, evangelical uh, missionaries, they're very zealous about evangelism and what that means in spreading the gospel and starting churches. This bishop, uh, <coughs> bishop uh, um, over there, he's very gung-ho about churches spreading. And, he, you know, I, I, like I joked, how long would it take a diocese in America to build 50 churches? <laughs> yeah. A long time. Right now, yeah. we know there's different building constraints, right? So, like, they can start building a church and have a burlap sack over it and do it, and nobody from the building codes inspectors right. comes and says, yeah, you can't do that! What are you doing here? You know, and you, you, they have an open hole and people just walk around it and the, the, guy, the guy from the, the sewage says, you can't do that! No, they just build it. And, and you, so you have to kind of get out of your mind that things kind of happen and kind of in this kind of lockstep sort of way that it would happen here. That, that there, is, there are ways in which it's easier to build over there, and there's ways in which it's more complicated. As I said, one of these churches, it took five years to sort out the deeds because they didn't, ha they, they didn't really have personal ownership in the same way that we would have personal ownership. Um, you really can't understand, in some ways, how tribes exist over there. It's not like, oh, well, we went into... We went into the to, to the Indian village, and there they all were. You know, this tribe has a, a million people, so it's, it's a it's a very it's a very different reality, and, and it stretches over cities and peoples and villages, and people know people from all. I mean, I was like, wow, you know somebody over? It's like, yeah, well, we're in we're in the same we're in the same tribe. Of course, I know them. Uh, so it, it's a very different reality. But I I would say like this. Um, how many of you, how many of you grew up in a, in a, in a, you know, around here? How many of you grew up around here? You probably still know all these people, and you say, oh yeah, you know, that's so-and-so's farm over there. Yeah, I went to school with his son over there, or I went, whatever, right? You hear that a lot. Um, so there's, especially in the South, the rural South, there's still some of that families and kind of, larger family units that people still think about. So, any other questions? Um, what did you do for uh, communion? Is that enough? We, 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 didn't, we didn't have communion because there are old school Anglicans doing communion once a month, and I wasn't there on communion Sunday. So they did morning prayer. See you later, Pat. Take, okay. That must take hours. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it would take hours, but it would take numerous stations right. to right. to distribute communion. Oh, yes. Probably have 20 people on the chalice. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you all very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.